This video is sponsored by KiwiCo. Move over JWST, move over Euclid, because the eyes of the astronomy world are all turning to look at the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is getting closer and closer to what's known as first light in August 2024, when after 13 years of construction in the Chilean desert, for the first time, light will be collected by the 8.4 metre wide mirror and travel through the telescope's optical system. Rubin really is one of the most ambitious astronomy projects we have ever seen. Yes, it's seen all the usual technological advancements that come with any new observatory, but Rubin stands out because of what it's going to attempt to do. You see, unlike other telescopes where, you know, astronomers might apply for time to use that telescope and drill down on one specific object that they are interested in, Rubin is going to complete a full survey of the entire sky every three nights. It will split up the sky like a mosaic and go back to each chunk of sky every three nights and record if anything has changed in that part of the sky. Whether that's an asteroid that's moved in those three nights, a star that's gone supernova, or a burping black hole. All of this together means that Rubin is going to collect a huge amount of data. Over its 10-year period of operations where it'll complete that survey, it's estimated that Rubin will detect 20 billion objects in the sky, and then every single night will flag 10 million things that have changed in the sky. Which means that over its 10 year survey, Rubin is set to collect 60 petabytes of data. To put that into perspective, that's 500 times more data than the Hubble Space Telescope has collected in the past 34 years since it launched in 1990. Or to put it another way, it's 1,500 times larger than the entirety of Amazon's databases, or 1 million times larger than all the data that makes up Wikipedia. So as you can imagine, Rubin is set to change the face of astronomy forever at least if we're prepared for that deluge of data. So in this video, we're going to chat first about who Vera Rubin was and why this telescope is named after her. Second, the new tech that's been developed for the Rubin Observatory, including the largest digital camera that's ever been built. Third, Rubin's main science goals. And four, what makes Rubin different from other survey telescopes like the Euclid Space Telescope, for example. Now, the Rubin Observatory has been made possible thanks to a huge team of scientists and engineers worldwide all working together to solve problems. And developing problem-solving skills like that starts in childhood. So if you want to encourage a kid in your family to grow into a creative thinker, then you've got to try one of the subscriptions from KiwiCo. Their crates provide fun learning for kids of all ages, whether it's about science or sensory play, games or geography. Each crate is designed by experts but tested by kids to make sure that they provide inspiration and excitement and discovery for all of those who engage. Even I, as a grown adult, absolutely loved this crate with their glowing pendulum experiment. Yes, it's so much fun to watch the chaotic patterns it traces out with the fluorescence. Oh man, I love chaos theory so much. But what I love is this, their magazine, which goes into so much more detail about chaos theory. You know, an idea that underpins so many different fields across science and maths, and yet they manage to explain it at a level that kids can engage with. Now, Pip, I think you're a bit young for this one. It says nine plus and you're only 13 weeks old. This crate was for ages nine plus, and I know when I was that age, I would have absolutely devoured all this information because I was just desperate for anything that would engage my curiosity outside of school. But KiwiCo also have crate subscriptions for younger kids too. So if there's a kid in your family that you know would love a KiwiCo subscription and you want to help support my channel and you can click on the link in the video description down below or you can use the code ASTRODOCTORBECKY to get 50% off your first month of monthly lines. So thank you so much to KiwiCo for sponsoring this video and now let's chat about who Vera Rubin was and why the Rubin Observatory is named after her. Vera Rubin was an astrophysicist who was born in 1928 in Philadelphia in the USA and she completed a PhD in astrophysics Astronomy at Georgetown University in Washington DC in 1954. Now, it was during a PhD that she was trying to work out how spiral galaxies rotate by measuring the speed of the stars in a galaxy with distance from the center by looking at the ever so slight difference in Doppler shift on their light. And when Rubin looked into this, she noticed that instead of the stars slowing down as you get further out in the galaxy, like what we see with planets in the solar system, the speed of stars in galaxies 
increases and then flattens out at the outskirts. Now, if we think about where all the matter, the stuff is in the solar system, it's all concentrated in the sun. The sun is 99.8% of all of the mass in the solar system. And when we look at galaxies, it looks like most of the stars, the mass, are again in the center because the galaxy looks brighter there. So technically the speed of stars should behave like the speed of the planets dropping off in the solar system, but it doesn't. And if you run the maths to try and explain the speed of the stars that we see in galaxies, then you find that all the mass must actually be concentrated on the outskirts, where the galaxy actually looks fainter. So Rubin's work kickstarted decades worth of research into the nature of dark matter and what it could possibly be made of, because particle physicists had no idea, but then also work into other areas like can we tweak our equations of gravity from Einstein's theory of general relativity to try and have a universe where we don't actually need dark matter and it's just that we've got maybe gravity wrong slightly. And if you want to know more about this, I've made a whole video on all the observational evidence we have for dark matter and then also videos on alternate theories of gravity that don't need dark matter, which I'll link below. And it's that dark matter connection that's really key here for why the Rubin Observatory was named after Rubin, because the reason for that survey of the sky that Rubin will do is not just to flag all the things that change, but also to make a map of all the positions and distances to galaxies in the universe. And then from that map, we can then work out where all the dark matter is as well, a 3D map of dark matter in our universe. We'll do this through a process known as gravitational lensing, where light from background galaxies gets bent around foreground galaxies, because you can't account for how much the light got bent with just the visible matter that's there. So a fitting name for a trailblazing telescope in the trailblazing astronomer of Vera Rubin. But to achieve all this, the Rubin Rubin Observatory needed new tech developing for it. That's not unusual, most new telescopes need new tech because they're doing something that's never been done before, like we saw with the James Webb Space Telescope. For Rubin, the standout is the camera, the thing that actually records the light that the telescope collects and focuses down. Rubin's camera is the largest and most advanced digital camera ever built. It has a 3.2 gigapixel sensor array, which will allow it to capture incredibly detailed images with spectacular resolution and sensitivity. But 3.2 gigapixels is 3.2 billion pixels. For comparison, most everyday cameras are measured in megapixels, millions of pixels. So my iPhone 13 Pro has a 12 megapixel camera, only 12 million pixels. Rubin's camera will be 267 times bigger than that, and 97 times more pixels than the camera I'm currently filming on. But it's not just hardware that had to be developed for Rubin, a whole new data management and processing and storage system had to be built to cope with the huge influx of data that we're gonna get from this telescope. And in that whole system, you know, there'll be the usual like image processing to take the raw images from the telescope and turn them into science ready images, plus like object detection from those image, but also real time classification of all of those 10 million alerts per night that something has changed in the sky. I spoke more about this in last week's video on how we use AI in astronomy. If you wanna check that out, I'll link it in the video description below. So with all of this new tech then, what are Rubin's main science goals? Well, we already heard about that 3D map of the universe that Rubin is gonna make from its survey data to be able to work out where all the dark matter is, but that map will also massively help galaxy evolution. This is my field of research. We look to see how galaxies have changed and evolved with time. Because light takes time to get to us, the more distant a galaxy is, the earlier in the universe's history that we're actually seeing it. So we see galaxies when they're only a few billion years old. So we can actually track how galaxies have changed and evolved in terms of their shape and how many stars they're forming and whether the supermassive black hole at their centers is active or not. So this is my area of research, so perhaps I'm a little bit bias when I say that this is the most exciting thing that Rubin will do, but I think most of my colleagues would probably argue that the most exciting science is going to come from those 10 million alerts per night that something has changed in the sky. Perhaps that'll be the discovery of a slew of new solar system objects like asteroids, comets, maybe even dwarf planets out on the edge of the solar system, or pulsing stars or burping black holes in our own galaxy. But those are just the known unknowns, like the things that we know exist in the universe, but that we perhaps haven't found all of them yet. 
There'll most likely, though, be a whole host of new discoveries in all that data that we know nothing about yet, like things that we did not know existed in the universe. The unknown unknowns. And of all the telescopes that are coming online in the next couple of years, I think that Rubin really is the one that will allow for the most blue sky research into the unknown. But finally, let's chat about how Rubin actually is different from Euclid, because if you've been following me for a while, you'll have heard me talk about the European Space Agency's Euclid Space Telescope, which launched last year in 2023. And you might be thinking that a lot of what I'm saying sounds very similar to what Euclid will be doing, because Euclid is also also set to take a survey of the sky to image galaxies and make a 3D map of the universe to study dark matter and dark energy. Also, side note, 820,000 images from Euclid's first year of operations had now been uploaded to the Galaxy Zoo website, which is a project which needs your help classifying their shapes so that the images can be labeled with those galaxy shapes to train an AI algorithm to then classify the next six years worth of data from Euclid, again, because just the sheer amount of data that we'll get from it, humans just can't keep up with. But while what Euclid and Rubin are doing is very complementary, they're not in competition with each other. And there are differences, the biggest one being in the wavelength range of light that they look in. So Euclid is detecting infrared light, whereas Rubin will detect ultraviolet, visible and near infrared light, which means that we can answer different science questions with the data from each telescope. But Euclid's images will be much more detailed and clearer than what we get from Rubin, because its field of view, while big for a space telescope, will be smaller than Rubin's. So its pixels will cover a smaller part of sky, so you'll get more detail about each object that you're looking at with Euclid. So you can see how the two will be complementary. You know, Rubin will give you the ultraviolet and the visible light where you need it, and then Euclid will give you the detail and the structure of all of the galaxies and objects that it detects. But the real difference comes from how the surveys are done. Euclid will slowly, over six years, work its way through all the chunks of sky in the mosaic, doing long exposures, making sure to drill down on that patch of sky to detect, you know, even the faintest of objects, and then slowly building up that big picture of the mosaic over time. Whereas Rubin's survey is going to be rapid and repeated. So as I said, the plan is that Rubin does a full survey of the sky every three nights. So within three nights, you will get that 3D map of the universe but it'll only be for the brightest of objects that it found in quite short exposures. But then it'll go back three nights later, observe the same chunk of sky, add together the images from what it had before, and slowly you will build up that map and make it more detailed and detect the fainter and fainter objects. The reason it does it this way though is so that it can detect all those things that change each night to produce those 10 million alerts that we'll have to sift through to try and find one of those elusive unknown unknowns. You can't do that with Euclid data. And that is what makes Rubin so special. For all of those who haven't seen my Instagram post, this is Pippin. Pip, really. Our new British short hair kitten. She's 13 weeks old now. And she's very cute. And she very much likes this piece of paper out of the Kimmy Girl thing. <laughs> she is a lilac British short hair and she is adorable. Uh, I just have to apologize to my disheveled state, but it's like 28 degrees here outside and it's probably even warmer in this house right now, so. And this result from Ruben is what kick result from Ruben. <laughs> is that piece of plastic giving you hours of entertainment? <laughs> She's been like this for like 10 minutes the entire time I built it. <laughs> Most blue sky research into the unknown. Into the unknown! I've got a towel here because it's so hot in this room that I'm just getting very sweaty. I feel like an Olympian. Like I'm just being patted down. Except there's no one doing it for me. It's just me in a spare room talking to myself and getting do warm. <laughs> But those are just the known unknowns, the things that we know to look for. For. The things that we know to look for. Uh.